All right, you're all set. Okay. So I'm going to be doing a, a presentation on suicidality and homicidality. My name is Tina Flosius. I am a licensed clinical social worker, um, and I work over at um, the Center for Victim Safety and Support for Family Services. I've been here for about um, eight months now. Most of my clinical experience has been working with individuals struggling with acute mental health needs um, and providing individual parent and family therapy. Um, as well as group therapy. So I'm really excited to do a training like this. I think, you know, um, the topic of suicidality, homicidality, and being able to provide an assessment is, is really important to clinical work, um, you know, regardless of which program you're in. And also, you know, unfortunately, it really does have a strong impact on the population in general. So I really feel strongly that having more information and education on these topics is, um, is, is important to have. Uh, so for the for the purpose of this training, um, I'm going to be referring to individuals as clients. Um, I know other people identify them as either patients or participants, depending on the setting. Um, but for just for this you know for this presentation, that they're going to be referred to as clients. You know, this training is really um, aimed to help provide information and education on suicide and homicide, how to do a risk assessment, understand the different levels of risk ideas on creating safety planning and have an idea about what, what different resources are available. So the topics directly that we're gonna be covering are definitions, myths, stigma, statistics, risk factors, risk assessments, levels of risk, confidentiality, safety planning, uh, resources, and obviously I have some references. So some of the definitions, um, that I have for you. Uh, some of them are a little bit more obvious than others. Um, so suicide, you know, the act of intentionally and voluntarily causing one's own death. Homicide is the legal term for any killing of a human being by another human being. Suicidal ideation is thinking about suicide in yourself, a suicidal thoughts. Uh, homicidal ideation is thinking about killing another person. Passive ideations, which could be suicidal, you know, passive ideations for suicide or homicide, um, are having ideations without plan or plans or intent. Um, so basically just kind of having thoughts, um, maybe a little bit more than ideations, but there are still passive thoughts, meaning there's not necessarily a definite plan or, um, you know, intent on doing so. Active ideations are having ideations, meaning having thoughts, um, but with plans, intent, and means. So there's that difference between active and passive, and that could again be for suicide or homicide. And lastly, self-harm, self-injurious behaviors is the active purpose of hurting oneself. So a lot of times people hear, you know, self-harm or self-injurious behaviors of, you know, someone maybe cutting themselves, um, or you know, could also include you know burning burning yourself. Um, you know, there's there's plenty of different ways that people put themselves in harm way. Um, so, but basically that term is specific to you know the act of, of hurting yourself on on purpose and not necessarily um, an act of suicide you know a suicide attempt, um, but a way that someone is hurting themselves. So there's a lot of overlap in gray area, but um, wanted to provide just that that clarity. So. Some myths and stigmas, these are mostly about, about suicidality so, or suicide. So asking a depressed person about suicide may put the, put the idea in their heads. There's no point in asking about suicidal thoughts. If someone is going to do it, they won't tell you. Someone making suicidal threats won't really do it. They're just looking for attention. If someone wants to kill themselves, they'll do it regardless of what you do. So I'm sure people watching this or hearing this um, have, you know, have heard a lot about these, these stigmas. I know I have. Um, I know, you know, before I maybe got, went to school or was trained in this, you know, I've had similar thoughts, right? Because there is a stigma around, around suicide that, you know, if you ask about it, it's going to put their idea in their head or, you know, they're looking for attention. Um, you know, and sometimes there are people who go to extreme measures um, when they're, they're really in pain. Um, and it, the, 
those need to, you know those gestures of what they're saying needs to be needs to be taken seriously. Even if what I always have said is that even if they are asking for attention, um, what a level they're going to to really to really get the help that they might that they might really need. So other, you know, just to add on, um, they wouldn't kill themselves since they have, like, you know, future plan coming up. Um, notions that, you know, some stigmas, notions that people who kill themselves are cowards and selfish, um, and they still persist. Um, the attempters who are often viewed as attention seekers who are not to be taken seriously, uh, and that there's a stigma towards survivors of suicide loss, uh, blame, uncertainty, judgment. So even those who, um, who have lost them to suicide um, and how that stigma impacts them as well. So, you know, they um, just to kind of circle back to the top one, um, you know, because they have a future plan, they won't, they won't commit suicide. So just to, just to clarify, having a future plan, having something to look forward to is a protective factor, right? So it is something that, that does help people when they're, um, when they might be having suicidal thoughts, um, but it isn't definitive as a sole reason of why someone wouldn't kill themselves. So just to kind of clarify that, yes, it is. A, it could be a protective factor, um, but obviously that's not 100% guaranteed. So it's something to kind of be mindful of when you're making that assessment or kind of looking at someone's overall risk. Um, and then the bottom three are really, you know, we mentioned the attention seekers already. You know, the other two are still other other stigmas about people who have either disclosed, you know, that they've had suicidal thoughts um, or have people who have killed themselves um, and how that impacts kind of what um, maybe what their family or survivors have, have experienced before um, or maybe what other people have said about those who have killed themselves. I'm sure there's plenty more that I didn't add here, um, but, you know, it's, it's hard work to kind of take away some of these stigmas and um, think about because, you know, when we think about how these stigmas impact people when reaching out for help, you know, and how these impact um, or continue to, to perpetuate this cycle, you know, of people not feeling like it's safe or comfortable to, to reach out for help because of these things. So these are some statistics um, for, for suicide. Some of these um, are alarming. Um, I know that I would felt kind of taken aback and by surprise. So suicide is the, the second leading cause of death for ages 10 through 34, and it's the 10th um, cause of death overall. Um, in the United States, there's an average of 123 suicides per day. Impacts all demographic groups. Men die by suicide 3.54 times more often than women, but yet women um, attempt suicide almost you know, 1.4 times as often as males, which I find interesting. Uh, the rate of suicide is highest in middle-aged white men, and some of these uh, percentages below, 46% of those who died by suicide had a known mental health diagnosis, 22% of people who had been raped also uh, had also attempted suicide at some point in their life, and 23% of people who had experienced a physical assault had also attempted suicide at some point in their life. So, you know, these those, those percentages are rather high, um, and they kind of link to mental health. There's a lot of link to abuse or trauma, um, which I could get into in a whole nother, it's all, a whole other presentation. Um, but I just wanted to kind of point that out as we lead into a discussion about risk factors um, and some of how, how high this really is its own, you know, epidemic um, suicide, second leading cause of death, um, and 10th cause of death overall. Those are pretty significant numbers. So these are some statistics for homicide. So, um, and this is uh, victims of homicide, I should be clear. 80% of homicide victims are ages 15 to 29. More than 75% of the people killed between 1999 and 2017 were male. 66% uh, of the female, uh, female murder victims were the wife or girlfriend of their killer um, when the offender was known. Almost 10% of homicides were known to have been perpetrated by an intimate partner. Homicide disproportionately impacts people of color. Homicide rates among black citizens uh, were over six times higher uh, than for white citizens, which I think is incredibly important to, to be mindful of and to know. Whereas suicide um, impacts all demographic groups, um, you know, homicide uh, disproportionately impacts, impacts um, people of color and minorities. 
Uh, between 1999 and 2017, more than two thirds of homicides involved guns and homicides generally are perpetrated by someone known to the victim. So, you know, 10%, um, as mentioned a couple above, um, were known to the uh, right partner, um, but almost all homicides in general are perpetrated by someone, someone who the victim knows already. So now we want to talk about risk factors. So risk factors are, um, are, are elements or things that um, could put someone at risk for suicide. So it doesn't necessarily mean that anyone who can check off one of these things or has experienced one of these things necessarily will commit suicide um, and same with homicide, but they are just things to be mindful of that put them at risk, meaning like a higher percentage um, or that just flags to kind of be mindful of again when, when looking at assessing someone for, for suicidality. So some of the risk factors for suicide is, um, is a history of suicide attempts, which, um, you know, as we know from the first slide, um, you know, more women than, more women than men have, um, have attempted suicide more than say, completing. Um, but approximately eight to 10 of attempters, suicide attempters will eventually die by suicide. Um, so eight to 10%, um, so it's actually the strongest risk factor um, of someone completing suicide is if they've attempted that's something really important to, to know. Uh, a history or use of alcohol or substances, a history of abuse. Um, so, you know, kind of on those percentages, we saw how high the percentages are for, for those um, about suicide experienced rape, physical assault, um, or abuse of some kind. So that's another risk factor, as is trauma. Uh, and trauma doesn't necessarily mean uh, abuse. Trauma could be, you know, any adverse event that that impacted someone or led to um, led to reactions, you know, emotional reactions, um, psychological reactions, physical reactions, um, and trauma again is different than you know PTSD. So PTSD is a mental health diagnosis um, that's specific to someone's reaction to a traumatic event, where certain symptoms have you know escalated or elevated. I believe after uh, after three months of after that event, where a certain persistent symptoms um, of trauma have uh, continued to occur and starting to impact their, their lives in some way or functioning. So about 27% of those who are diagnosed with PTSD within their lifetime um, have also attempted suicide. So again, it's also a really high number of 27%. Um, and that statistic is really for those who've been diagnosed with PTSD. Um, and that does, so that doesn't even include all the people who've ever who have experienced trauma, excuse me. Um, so trauma itself and, and PTSD is a really strong risk factor for suicide as well. Psychiatric comorbidity. So that's when um, a person has more than one disorder, meaning that someone could have a diagnosis of bipolar and schizophrenia, um, PTSD, um, and you know, major depression disorder. So those are um, all common diagnoses that have experienced, you know, that typically have symptoms of experiencing suicidal thoughts. Medical problems and chronic pain, um, recent losses, so it could be financial, physical, or personal. Um, so think of people who've had you know, really bad, um, maybe really bad breakup or a loss, um, someone close to them has passed away, um, loss of a job, their financial income, um, you know, or physical losses, maybe they lost their house. Um, or their, you know, needs of transportation, things like that. Um, or maybe lots of other physical things, material items, things that meant a lot to them, um, things like that. So impulsivity, uh, poor self-control, a family history of suicide, hopelessness and despair. Hopelessness is another strong predictor of um, suicidal ideation and self-destructive behavior. Um, which really coincides a lot with despair. So people who have um, not a lot of hope, who are in either emotional pain or physical pain, and having a lot of despair, um, those are also really big risk factors up there with, um, with the history of suicide attempts. Um, and then vulnerable populations that are just more, that are more at risk of, of suicidality is LGBT youth, um, veterans, refugees, um, and then indigenous people. So, you know, a lot of, um, and one of the other things too, um, for you know the chronic pain um, and unemployment, you know under uh, recent losses of that um, financial. So 
a lot of this is too is events, particular events that bring on feelings of humiliation, guilt, um, shame. A lot of those feelings um, can really impact or bring about um, some suicidal thoughts as another risk factor. So there are um, some risk factors for homicide. So we, I separated it by um, for victims and perpetrators. So again, I just want to be clear that you know, under, especially under the perpetrator. So some of these risk factors, again, if someone has one or two of these things, it doesn't mean that they will, you know, become um, a perpetrator, but it's more of how some of these things listed are what they have found is in common with, with those who um, have, you know, acted on uh, homicidal thoughts. So some risk factors for victims, um, victims of homicide, poverty, uh, economic inequality, availability of guns um, and alcohol, gang affiliation, um, absence of good governance and effective rule of law, transitions in political regimes, um, where young people, particularly young males, make up a greater share of the population, um, and being in an intimate partner violent um, relationship. Um, this is also, a lot of this information was taken from WHO, the World Health Organization, so just want to be mindful that um, some of these statistics are specific to the United States, but also to, you know, worldwide. And then for perpetrators, having a mental health illness, particularly that leads to social isolation, um, poor cognitive control and emotional regulation, not having a strong uh, moral compass or role models and learning about, you know, conflict resolution, um, and then repeated exposure to violence and other violent rhetoric. So risk assessments, when and how so, a lot, you know, if you look, some of them look fairly, you know, they look kind of similar for both suicide and homicide. Um, but as far as the when, when would you need to risk uh, assess some of the level of risk and what that could look like? So for both is when clients indicate having suicidal or homicidal thoughts, um, plans, action, intent, um, or, you know, self-harm thoughts for suicide. So for, you know, for a client, for example, if they, if a client says everything is so helpless, I might as well be dead. Um, I'm just so angry, I could kill him, right? Those are, you know, clear indicators where clients are mentioning something about suicide or homicide. So the next part of how, how would you kind of assess and what would that really look like? So to basically, you would want, you know, to pay out, obviously, those who are listening might work in different programs or might be different protocols, so I encourage you to, you know, adhere to your specific program as far as what that means. Um, but for the purpose of this uh, presentation, you want to ask open-ended questions about current intent, plans, and means. Um, for homicide specifically, you want to ask about target, um, and you also want to ask about protective factors. So remembering those myths, asking about their safety and plans does put ideas into their heads. Particularly, as most of the time, if you're asking about these things, there's been a clue as far as um, their thoughts and why you don't even be asking in the first place, right? So, um, asking open ended questions will really just help to create clear communication and lead to creating a safety plan and action steps. So, I want to be clear because I think sometimes it can be really hard to just ask someone, um, but try to remember too is that if you're asking, unless it's the first time that you're meeting them and it's an assessment, you know, just getting their history. More often times it's you're asking because something they said kind of gave you a, a red flag of follow up with this, right? And it can be scary to go down that road. But it's also really important because they, we want to help keep them safe. We want to help create a plan. And to create a safe plan, we need to know the reality of how they're, what they're thinking about. Um, so, you know, responses to these, um, you know, to their statements and some of the things they mentioned should be really be non-judgmental and calm. You're going to help provide them with support and come up with a plan. Um, so exploring their thoughts and plans to, you know, a point where we can understand what they need is really important. So finding ways to acknowledge their feelings, expressing concern for their safety and safety of others um, is, is helpful to them and helpful in assessing and assessing their risk. So a couple examples, like I mentioned before, everything is so helpful, helpless, um, helpless, Everything is so helpless, I might as well be dead. So a response to that could be, I can hear how much you're struggling right now. How, how often are you having thoughts about suicide? Just right, providing that support and asking for that clarification of how often has this been going on? Um, you know, I'm just so angry I can kill him. 
you know, you could say, I can appreciate, um, you know, how strong anger can be and feel. You know, do you, do you have thoughts about killing him? You could also ask, you know, have you had a lot of thoughts about him in his life? Um, again, really clear questions to find out, you know, sometimes people say things, you know, out of anger or frustration and they don't, they might not necessarily have any intent behind those ideations, right? So we want, when we kind of break it down, we want to kind of look at, are these just ideations and thoughts? Are these ideations and thoughts that have intent behind them? You know, um, is there plans behind that intent and um, are there kind of action steps that people are taking? Um, you know, so another example could be with the client says, I just think things would be easier if I was gone. You know, what does gone look like? Can you tell me what, what does that mean? That could mean that they just want to be, you know, not have this thing going on. I'm so frustrated with things. I just wish this wasn't going on. This situation, it doesn't mean that they want to kill themselves. Um, it might mean, yeah, I, I have thought about it. Things would be easier if I was dead. Okay, that's then that kind of leads to another discussion of, you know, how do we, how do we kind of assess the severity of those thoughts and what would be the next best, um, the next step for you? Um, you know, so depending on how they respond to that, you know, another response um, could be something like, I hear that you've been thinking a lot about, um, I hear that you've been thinking a lot about suicide and even have plans that you might follow through with. I'm worried about your safety. I hope that we can get you the help that you might need. Can we try to figure this out together? You know, I'm here for you and, you know, you're not alone and I'm here for any support you need. So, so it's kind of addressing that after hearing that of, you know, I'm worried for your safety. You know, can we come up with a plan because, you know, I'm here for you. Um, you know, or on the other side, if someone is talking to you specifically about, a, you know, a plan of homicide or hurting someone else, um, you know, I understand that you're really angry and upset with this person, you know, to the point where you really consider hurting them and taking action. Um, I know the anger feels really strong right now, and I know that I'd like to help you in finding safe ways to release that anger. I worry about their safety and how hurting them may impact, you know, may impact you in the long run. So, you know, kind of, again, expressing how uh, bringing it back to them and your concern for them and, and for their safety or for someone else's safety and kind of bringing it back to how can we kind of help and, and get to that next, what's that next step look like? Um, so, you know, those are some of the types of questions and responses you may want to give depending on what the client shares with you and kind of clarifying what they mean. You know, was it just kind of a whim of a comment? Was it a comment that does have some intent behind it? Um, you know, are there beyond that intent, are there plans and action steps that they've taken? So, you know, yeah, now that you've mentioned it, I, you know, I have been thinking about suicide a lot. You know, if I was to do it, you know, I would just, you know, take Tylenol and, and have some, you know, have some alcohol. Um, and then you might ask, okay, do you have, you know, do you have access to, to that, you know, to that medication, that alcohol? Do you have a plan on how you do this? You know, person might say, no, it's just, but it's just an idea that I've been thinking about a lot. Um, versus, yeah, you know, I was going to do it today when I got home. Um, you know, one is indicating that there is a lot of concern that someone's having frequent ongoing thoughts with a tentative plan um, and kind of needing to get, you know, action pretty quickly. And the other one is saying, okay, yes, I have a plan. I have intent. I have means. Um, and I have a pretty, a pretty clear plan. And that one might take more immediate action, um, you know, during that conversation. So, you know, clarifying um, and having an idea about their their uh, their risk level in that moment. If you have you know imminent concerns about their um, safety to yourself and others, you want to make sure you're on a hotline. Um, you want to confirm their name. You know their their callback number, their location. If they're with you in the office, um, you want to really be you know either way. You want to really be open that you have some concerns for their safety, um, their safety or safety to others. And let them know that you, you have to notify a third party, whether it's your supervisor, um, you know, call the uh, crisis line or mobile crisis to come to an evaluation, or whether you're a licensed clinician yourself and say, you know, we might need to call, you know, call for an ambulance or have you go um, get an evaluation done about at the hospital. Um, so either way, you know, being really open and honest with that client about your, your concern for their safety and the safety of others, and let them know, be upfront with what your next action step has to be as well. So, you know, this is, um, these are different levels of risk that I identified. Um, 
you know, each program or place might be a little different, um, but low, moderate, and imminent risk. So low risk is really when there's, you know, current ideation um, with no plans, intent, or means. Um, you know, typically there is passive, um, there could be passive ideations at that point. So thoughts of dying, wishing one was dead, um, thoughts of killing everyone without a confirmed target. So those are, again, low risk, meaning that it's not nothing, um, but it's low as far as not having, you know, an immediate plan on what they would do next in that moment or next in that day. Moderate risk would be um, current ideations with identified plans, maybe some ambivalent intent, um, possible means. Could be passive or active um, ideations at that point. So maybe some thoughts about suicide or homicide, but unsure if you follow through with it. Maybe could have means, could have an idea around target. Um, it's one of those tricky ones where nothing's really confirmed. You know, it's not a client that's giving you reassurance of always, it was just, you know, saying I really have no plans, I have no thoughts about it, I just kind of said it because I'm angry. Um, this one is where, you know, I'm kind of thinking about it, you know, kind of want to do it, don't really want to do it. Um, you know, I know my family would be really, you know, upset and distraught, but I really can't take this. You know, I have some Tylenol, um, you know, that was kind of my plan, but I'd have to go to the store and get more, you know. Um, I'm not really sure, I'm just thinking about it a lot. Um, so those kinds, that kind of ambivalent stage, which in my opinion is kind of the hardest one to assess because it's, they're not sure, you know, um, and so it's really up to us to kind of really work with them to, to kind of assess that risk and work with um, obviously our, our supervisors or licensed professional, um, you know, because those ones are a little more tricky. Imminent risk, um, what I have is, you know, current ideations with identified plans, um, target, intent, and needs. So, you know, this at this point, someone's likely to have really active thoughts. So they have a plan, a method, means, opportunity, and target more for homicide. Um, but it's really clear that this person's at risk. So, you know, these ones, um, this situation would be when, you know, someone like I told you earlier was, oh, sorry, I'm not sure what happened there. Um, let's see if I, okay, sorry. Um, so this would be when, sorry guys. So this would be when someone um, is an imminent risk if they say, you know, I have, you know, I'm so angry with them, they ruined my life, I'm so, I hate them so much, and no one's doing anything, I'm going to, you know, I know where they work, um, I have a gun, I have, I have bullets, um, you know, I have a car, I'm gonna go drive them, you know, drive over there, once they're done with their shift, and that's it, I'm gonna kill them, right? That's a plan, that's, you know, method, that's means, opportunity, that's a target. Um, that's very clear, you know, that that person is, um, you know, is at imminent risk of acting on some of these thoughts. Um, you know, where they're going around, I have, you know, I can't take this anymore. I, you know, I've tried everything. I'm all alone. No one's here for me. Um, you know, I've been researching ways to, you know, to do it so that it works. Um, I'm going to take, you know, a whole bottle of, of Tylenol. Um, I'm going to drink this much, you know, until I pass out. Um, I've written a note, you know, that's it. No one's home, you know, no one's home tonight. So, you know, I have the night to myself, I can't do it then. Um, again, that's a plan, that's a method, that's means. Um, in this case, opportunity, no one's around. Um, so that's kind of clearly thought out. So those ones are a little kind of easier because it's like, okay, well, now I know I need to take that, you know, kind of next step and they're at risk, it's really clear. So then we want to look at what's next. Okay, now we have, we've worked to decipher what level of risk I think that they're at based on my questions, based on what they've told me, um, you know, and, you know, and that's also, um, I apologize, I should have said this on the other screen, um, taking, of, taking in what their protective factors might be. So, you know, um, talked a little bit before about protective factors, um, characteristics and qualities, attributes um, that are associated with reducing risk of suicide. So um, someone maybe lost their job, but they have interviews coming up. Um, someone who has uh, mental health disorders, but they have a really strong, you know, outpatient treatment team. Um, you know, someone who feels really isolated and is alone, but they live with a lot of people who they know really care for them or rely on them even. Um, 
people who, you know, those who may uh, have a lot of homicidal ideation toward an abuser, um, but they have kids and really want to, you know, raise them um, and be there for them. So protective factors are things that may reduce someone's risk of acting on something. So those um, shouldn't necessarily negate any suicidal or homicidal um, statements or accounts, um, but they are things that can be considered when you're assessing someone's risk and sharing that level of risk with a licensed professional, with a supervisor to help understand uh, someone's needs. Um, so as far as what's next, you know, you've learned, so you've learned someone is at risk of suicide or serious about causing harm to someone else. You've gathered information, have an idea about their level of risk, um, and you have concern for their safety um, and, or you're concerned for the safety of someone else. So next steps, be mindful. Um, you may need to bring confidentiality. You may need to create a safety plan. Um, you should be mindful, uh, confirm their name, their location, their callback number. Again, this is maybe more specific to if you're on the phone with them um, or if you're talking to them over the phone. Be really clear with them and transparent that, you know, you're worried, um, that you're very worried for their or for other safeties. Just be being really transparent. Um, that will help that, that process as hard as that might be um, to, to be on the same page with them um, and to keep working on, you know, having that trust there again, depending on the relationship anyway. Uh, and then also informing them again that you will, you, know, you might need to speak to a third party about their concerns. Again, transparency is really important and helpful for trust, for safety, um, just to being on the same page with, um, with this client. Um, that could be a supervisor, that could be um, a colleague that's a licensed professional, a um, mental health provider, that could be you know, authorities, crisis line, 911, it really depends on the situation. Um, but just being upfront with them that you might need to speak to someone about about their about your concerns. So breaking confidentiality, I don't want to get too into this part, but I think it's really important to know or to remember. Um, so there are a couple of reasons why um, professionals, and I can only really speak in this situation to you know, licensed clinical social workers, but most licensed professionals, um, there's only a couple of reasons why we would break confidentiality depending on our uh, guidelines where um, which program you are all in and what those guidelines um, for confidentiality are. Um, either way, there's really only uh, for a couple of reasons. One of them is if you expect abuse and neglect to someone who's under 18 by someone over 18, if you're being subpoenaed by an order that's signed by a judge, um, if, you, you know, if your notes or anything are being audited, um, if you have signed consent from the client or client's legal guardian. And the last are really specific to this presentation, which is if you have a concern of safety to self, or concern of safety to others, AKA duty to warn. So, you know, keeping information confidential doesn't apply when disclosure is necessary to prevent serious, foreseeable, and imminent harm to a client or to someone else. So, you know, if someone is clearly having, um, you know, suicidal thoughts with a plan, with, um, with a plan and intent means that's so again, looking at that key line of um, serious, foreseeable and imminent harm. Um, if someone has homicidal thoughts with a plan, a target means um, where it's, you know, and it's preventable. Those things do, um, do warrant breach of confidentiality. So all situations that indicate the need to break confidentiality um, should be discussed with a supervisor. So even if you end up talking to someone who's licensed for further feedback about the mental health or the risk aspect, um, breaking confidentiality should always be done with um, talking to a supervisor as well. So the next piece would be, you, you know, would be safety planning as far as what that, um, what that would look like. You know, it's going to depend on what level of risk you think they are or what level of risk you and your colleagues or your licensed, um, licensed professional or colleagues think. So uh, imminent and moderate risk, again, foreseeable, imminent, serious harm that could be prevented. Um, duty to warn, it would be when you actually um, inform third party or authorities um, if a client poses a threat um, to themselves or to another identifiable individual. It could be 10 one uh, asking for an ambulance to be sent to where they are um, for you know, an emergency psych evaluation, even if they persist. Um, if they are really that much at risk and they need um, an assessment uh, done at the hospital. Calling the mobile crisis um, through Dutchess County Helpline. Uh, I think as of right now, um, which is the end of August, I don't believe that they are currently doing mobile 
um, assess, uh, doing assessments in person. I don't believe they're going to someone's house right now. I could be wrong, um, but in, uh, for a date of reference, that would be the end of August. But they could be used um, for you know, talking to someone over the phone and getting an assessment that way. Um, when COVID isn't happening, they do often go to the home or to another location to provide an assessment if you, if you or your colleagues are not licensed professionals. Um, contacting a supervisor and then create, you know, creating a safety plan either way. Low risk, um, that's when it may not indicate immediate intervention, but there is a concern of safety. So again, people, uh, clients kind of making more passive comments about suicide, um, more passive comments about hurting someone else, um, but not necessarily enough to say, okay, we need to break confidentiality, we need to call X, Y, or Z. Um, you know, again, crisis stabilization is a great resource for them to call themselves. Um, they are doing things, you know, over the phone. They can use a, you know, a suicide hotline um, in the future um, or, you know, in that moment after calling you. Uh, they can call mobile crisis, which is pretty similar to the crisis stabilization, but mobile crisis, um, you know, 2 one one is another free resource. Um, again, in contact with the supervisor, maybe refer them to counseling, either with your program or another program. Uh, and creating a safety plan. So, you know, there's a lot in common between those two is creating a safety plan, contact, contacting who you might need in that moment to assess um, safety and next steps. Um, and then there's obviously just a difference when it's more imminent or not. Uh, some tips in creating a safety plan. Um, so I know I've mentioned this a couple times, so, you know, don't swear to secrecy, um, you know, be really upfront and honest about what you might need to do on your end. So, you know, I promise I won't tell anyone or, you know, I swear this is just between us or, you know, it's all confidential. Um, you want to be mindful of that, of saying, you know, the exception to, you know, this all being confidential is if I have concerns of your safety or safety of someone else or abuse, um, because you really want to set that, that framework of, yes, everything is confidential. Um, with the caveat of, of safety. Um, so that from the start, they're aware, heaven forbid you have to recircle um, to that point or in that moment kind of say, okay, these are the next steps that I, you know, that I'll need to take um, with you, right? To help keep you safe, to help keep someone else safe. Um, don't leave them alone. This is more if you're in, you know, in person um, or, you know, if they're at the office, I know things are a little strange with COVID, um, but if you have concern about, about their, them hurting themselves or hurting someone else, you know, try to call in a colleague or call someone to come, you know, join you guys for an assessment um, or, you know, calling, depending on where you are, you know, you can always call for, you know, an ambulance to come and bring them to the hospital for a psyche valve, um, things like that. Again, all these things should be talked about with your supervisor, um, but that's kind of what it means to end up, don't leave them alone. Um, you know, if someone talks about having, you know, strong suicidal ideations and you're doing a home visit, let's say, you know, I would try to figure out a safety plan and calling next steps before leaving their before leaving them at home without doing that step. Um, you know, trying not to be judgmental, surprised or shocked. Um, I know sometimes you can be surprised at what people say, um, whether that's how much they share, um, you know, or some of the things that they might talk about. Um, so just being mindful too of your own reactions because that person is really looking to you uh, to be there for them and to to help them out of this situation ask questions directly to create a plan. So again, even if it feels like, am I, is this too far? Am I just, just talking about this very bluntly? Um, but asking questions really directly can act just help get to the bottom of what is it that you're feeling and thinking? What is it that you need? And how can I, how can I help you? Um, and sometimes it's, sometimes people aren't ready to share, don't want to, and that's okay. Um, and it will, even that might help you know what next steps to take. Um, create steps that will um, escalate until one is safe. So they, um, so the safety planning steps, you know, might be, um, okay, you start to have suicidal thoughts again, you know, what steps can you take? You know, maybe they identify three coping strategies that they can do, you know, I'll paint, I'll walk my dog, um, I'll take a really hot shower. Okay, if those, you know, if those coping strategies don't help, what's my next step? Okay, I'll call, you know, I'll call my mom and then I'll call my sister because they, you know, they always make me laugh or they, they help. Okay, what if that doesn't work? Okay, well, at that point, if it doesn't work, I need to call, you know, my therapist or I need to call the crisis line because, you know, usually those things work, right? So that's, you know, that plan, um, those steps escalate um, 
until that person is safe. So they kind of get more and, you know, bringing more people into the mix. Um, they try and themselves to use skills. Um, then they reach out for support. You know, then they're calling their professional, um, you know, or the crisis line because they know at that point if it's not working, those thoughts are really persistent. So they need to kind of get more help uh, and more support until, you know, if it's if it's at that point, so that we can ensure that they're safe. Um, sometimes, you know, putting a safety plan in writing for both parties can be a really helpful tool. Okay, let's kind of, you know, if you know you're working with someone um, who has a history of suicidality or self injurious behaviors, um, it might be helpful to come up with a plan to use just in general, right? Um, it'll differ back to our safety plan. Let's see, you know, do we need to use it? Do we need to add anything or change it? Um, just so that it's done right from the start, you know, so that way, again, you can kind of refer back to it. Um, or if it's you know a one-time thing, it can be a helpful way for people to to know what to do, right? They have something concrete for them to hold. You know, okay, this is what I'm supposed to do. I realize I don't want to do any of this. Nothing's working, so I need to just call for help um, right now and revisit this. Um, you know, or it could really help someone kind of take the steps, especially if they're helping in creative, right? You can use what you know their own coping skills, their protective factors. Um, you know, to help keep them safe. It's more likely that they'll use it if they help create it. Um, so, you know, within those um, follow steps, so within those safety plans, uh, you, you know, you want to identify when a plan should be used, a list of activities that will be calming, um, identify reasons for living, um, or identify reasons to not act on certain thoughts, whether they're, you know, harming someone else, uh, identify supportive people who you can talk to personally and professionally. So, you know, if you're having homicidal thoughts, meaning about someone who's really hurt you, um, okay, when you should use that plan is when you start to have those thoughts. Um, list of activities that will be calming or distracting, you know, identifying reasons why you wouldn't want to do that. You know, uh, I'm afraid of being incarcerated, I'm afraid of jail, or um, I'm afraid of putting myself at risk, or my kids at risk, you know, or my kids going, you know, not, be, not being able to raise my children. Um, identifying people who you can talk to, and that should include professional. So those are just some ideas um, of how to create a safety plan. Again, these are maybe for more of those situations where someone's at low risk um, or maybe moderate risk when it's not as clear. Um, and that moderate risk, you know, you can also include follow-up in that safety plan of, okay, you know, you're leaving my, my office or my session, whether it's remote, um, you know, and maybe, you know, they were a little unsure. Let me make sure I tell my supervisor that I had this session. This client was a little, you know, on edge. This is kind of what's going on. This is the plan we made. Um, so your supervisor is aware and can offer you support. And maybe part of that plan is circling back with that client, you know, before your next session to kind of say, hey, I just wanted to check in. Um, I know yesterday was a little difficult. Just wanted to see where things are. Um, so that can be part of the safety plan too. So you can be really creative. Um, you know, you can be really as thorough, you know, I think being as thorough as you can is always helpful. Um, and, you know, don't be, don't be afraid to reach out for, you know, your own support. These topics are really hard. Um, and sometimes things aren't as clear as maybe we want them to be um, so that we know what to do. Sometimes things are a little ambivalent. Um, these, these topics and these emotions can be quite complex. So when in doubt, you know, talk to your supervisor. Um, you know, you can always circle back with clients. If you feel like, you know, I'm not sure, I'm a little worried. So there are there are options. Um, and so you know it's 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 difficult. So you know, just keep on, uh, you know, keep that communication alive, communication open with your team, with your supervisor, um, and with that client. So those are just some ideas and tips. Um, so I think I think we're almost done. The next page is resources. Um, so those are different phone numbers to call, the Crisis Equalization Center um, here in Dutchess County, Mobile Crisis, which is, you know, two and one is a free resource, the Suicide Hotline, 911, uh, a Crisis Text Line, um, three text, you know, MHA, um, Warm Line, those are for people who aren't in crisis but still want to talk to someone, and then uh, to create a safety plan. So that's kind of a more detailed website on different ideas on how to, uh, how to create a safety plan with someone else. And then these are just different references that I used. Um, they're also good resources, but just different references. So thank you all so much. And don't ever hesitate to find me or email me uh, if you ever have any questions or concern. Thank you so much.
Thanks, Tina. Have a great day. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye. Bye. Bye.